Welcome, this is where nerds come to learn things. If it's your first time here, click on the subscribe button and on the bell icon to get notifications about new videos. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoy it. Okay, so here's the power supply, as you can see. This is the same as one I had before, the E3646A, which I repaired previously, which had a bad regulator sensor thing. So I don't know if this works, it's supposed to be, it claimed to be tested, but there were no photos of it being powered up. It's got a seal on here, which means I can't actually open it without breaking the warranty seal. So technically I can't actually change the voltage without breaking it, and which means I won't have a warranty if I change the voltage. Not particularly fair, but anyway, at least I stuck this label on the top here saying about the actual line voltages, you know. Anyway, so it tells about changing the line voltage, which I know anyway. What I'm going to do though, because I don't want to break the seal, I'm going to power it up with 110 volts off my Variac first. Do some basic testing and verify that it works. If it works okay, then I'll break the seal and change the voltage. Seems like a sensible thing to do, doesn't it? So let's get the power plug. I've already got my Variac turned on and set to 100 and... What's it sitting on right now? 108 volts are sitting on right now. Plug in power. No smoke so far. I just got a high power switch anyway. So... Just push the button, see what happens. Coming, fan is running, air is coming out, no errors. Okay, well, turn the output on, output one, output two, both look okay. The control seems a bit dodgy. Yeah, that control's bad, there's an issue with the control. Might be a broken track, broken solder joint or something. Let's do high range. Wind it up some more. So it's definitely got an issue there. If I pull sideways on it, it works okay. Yep, yeah, alright. Pull sideways that way. I'm going that way with it, it works. Oh, we'll make that in high range as well. Not with anything. Push upwards, it goes. Downwards, it goes. Left, it goes. Right it goes, so it's probably got some, must be bad connections, but buzz will find out. So it says it's doing that voltage, let's put a meter on it and see what's actually coming out. Anyway, let's try each one, so shut the probe in there. Both channels are set at 20 volts now, so it should both be 20 volts. It is, and it is. That looks reasonably promising then, doesn't it? Okay. Is that one? I'll try and to do this now. There you go, self-test. Passed. Cool. So at least the self-test passed. So it appears to be functional. Alright, so I'll open it up, change the voltage. I've done this before on camera when I did the um, the other power supply. But I thought I'd show it again. Why not? This screw here I've tried just now is really tight. It doesn't want to budge. So I might have to come back to that one after the other ones are loose. By warranty seal. I think changing changing the voltage is a reasonable reason to remove the seal, wasn't it? Mind you, I had an issue with that once before. I had a eBay purchase. It was a uh, distribution amplifier actually for doing 10 megahertz distribution, and uh, the unit had an internal power supply settings. And because I opened it up and it didn't work and it was damaged, um, I only found out after I opened it to order to change voltages. Um, I actually lost my appeal saying it was uh, faulty because I'd opened it. So that's a bit of a pain. Let's try and get this buffer off, bumper off here. It does just pull off. There you go. So this is a quite rigid, this is definitely an original one, it's a bit stiff. And I've got these, what are those? I think there's a Torx, Torx drive there. Let's get those out, let's find a drive. So these are, what? Torx 15, I think that is, I think that's 15. All, right. All these other screws are really tight, so we'll see how this goes. I'm 
hoping that this will uh, free up that last screw which is really tight by having the casing move around a little bit. Probably always going to require. Hoping so. Yep, there we go. Usually works. Okay, slide this off. Now the power supply settings are over here on that switch just there. It's actually marked on the PCB as well. Well, I mean, let's have a little look around so I can see anything which looks bad as well. I know that the so this control is not looking the best, and I can see the solder joints. This maybe I should just resolder those while it's open. I think actually I can see a crack one, so I might just do that as well while I'm in here. Be a nice little quick repair. It won't take long, will it? Let's take a look at the caps in there. They look okay, I can't see any obvious bad caps. They look fine. The other one I had um, caps replaced. I had to replace them as well. Yeah, it's all looking fine. Let's change this voltage. So, let's see. Switch on the side here is 230 volt that way and that way. Let's make sure. Get that correct. Let's put this diagram here. 230 volt inner switches. By switches in this. Yep, done that. So that's resolder that connection on the back there. Those tabs there, so I think that's probably what's wrong. If it's not that, then it will be potentially a bad control. But it looks like it's probably a standard encoder format. It doesn't have any indents though. So I don't know, we'll have to see about that. There's a bit of wobbling on there. Yeah, I can see the top trace is cracked around that pin. Can I get that out? Yes, I can. Just wondering if the nut is also loose. For it to be wobbling around. Looks like it's been off actually. Is that moving or not? No, no, I think it's just the shaft which is loose. Yeah, that's not moving around. See, it looks a bit dirty around there. But the shaft is not... I think it's just the shaft which is loose on it. A bit of play in there. The nut isn't loose, so I think that's okay. Okay, so there's the back of the encoder. You can see the uh, earth tabs there, which actually anchor it down. And you can see the three terminals there of the encoder. And so the top one, which is the most, rightmost one in this case, um, looks like it's got a little crack around it. This can going to resolder that, and that'll probably be all it needs. See what I'm doing, hopefully. I want it to get to, to uh, flow right through to the other side of the board as well. Because it's broken this side, it's probably broken the other side as well. And it looks like that's where and the tracks will come off this side, but it may not matter. But I can see the top one here is definitely cracked. So, but I still have to get it to go right through the board if I can. And the mounts actually look okay, I'm not going to touch those. They look alright. Okay, so that could be all that's required for that. Let's uh, power it back up again. Now, I can, now I've switched that voltage setting around. I can put my variator back, back up to uh, the right voltage. So that be 230 volt. Should probably put that knob back on, shouldn't I? So that's on 240 volt now, well 230 volt. Channel 1. Uh, output on, let's do it. Here we go. Oh, no, I think it's still missing. It's better. Not sure. It's still missing some counts, so maybe it needs needs a clean as well. 
Or maybe there's a better connection from those traces, that's possible too. It's definitely improved, but... See that's missing there? Yeah. It's still got some issues. Are there more problems? That one there's got a trace coming off it. Which goes across the board to that via there. This one's got a trace coming off it, it goes across the board and goes to that via there. Which you can probably just see. So there's two vias right there and there. Those are the ones which go to that. So if I measure from the pin to those vias, I should get a reasonable reading. Should get low resistance and hopefully a consistent one. Six here, yeah, it looks absolutely fine. Let's try this one, which was the one which was cracked. No, it's looking okay. So maybe it's this one here, which is the problem with the grounding. It looks like it's grounded anyway. Hmm. That's not grounded. I should have a clean up on that one, let's have a closer look at it. Okay, so I've cleaned that connection up, a little bit of IPA and a bit, a bit of a scrub, and that does not go to the mesh. So there must be another trace on the other side of the board, which is uh, probably a positive supply. So it's probably that side which is broken. I might have to put up circuit diagrams and have a look and see where it goes to, see if I can figure out whether that's the problem or not. It could be the actual encoder itself, and it's likely I've got something I can use to replace it with. Uh, I may or may not have one, I'm not sure. So, I was trying to diagnose this uh, voter encoder here, I made a mistake, and I've blown up this QFN package right here. So, um, I was trying to probe around the outputs of this encoder, and I did it wrong and I blew it up. So obviously I've pulled the front panel apart, this is where the front panel goes. Uh, get the display, I'll show you what that looks like. Here's a display module. As you can see I've already taken out because all the chips are underneath the display. And um, this chip which is blown, it is a N80C51BH, so it's an 80, N80C5B1. So that's a, basically a 51 series. So that's blown. Right, so that's a 34401 88804 revision 1. Now, there's been other videos done by people which have replaced this chip, and luckily for me, there's resources available. Um, I think Signal Path actually did one on it as well, and some other people, um, there's other documented resources saying about this chip and someone actually made the firmware available for it. So because there's firmware available and cross-references for an alternative part I've ordered the parts, I've ordered some uh, PLCC sockets and I've downloaded the firmware. So I am basically all set uh, and I've purchased a program as well. So I'm basically all set to replace this chip. I've been very lucky um, because of what the work other people have done. So uh, I think it's on a is it KOBB something website? I can't remember what it's called now. But the firmware is on there and um, I can't remember exactly who it was that published it now, but there's it's been very helpful. So it's really good that other people in the electronics community are sharing the information they have, you know, which is part of the reason I do it as well, as I'll share what I have. So once I've actually got this done, I'll publish the information on my site as well, so it's other repositories for the same information. Um, hopefully that'll be helpful to people. That's the plan at least. Obviously this video also document too, but you know you obviously can't download download the firmware from inside the video. So I'm waiting for this part to turn up and also waiting for a program to turn up. I'm waiting for the TL866 version 2 plus or whatever it is. And it comes with a whole bunch of adapters, PLCCCs are one of them. It's gonna take a couple of weeks or so for that to arrive, so I'll might obviously won't publish a video until then. So yeah. What I was basically getting is, with this chip in place, um, there was 
no display, it beeped twice on startup as well. So I should mention all these things I was seeing. I should have recorded it actually. I was too busy you know, wondering what the hell I'd just done. But um, so yeah, beeped twice on startup, no display. And what I found was that this voltage regulator just here was getting very hot. That's a 5 volt regulator which runs this chip and a few other things as well. Also the voltages on the supply which go to this so it should be about 12.6 volts, I think it was in light from memory um, feeding back from this chip they were more like 15 volts so before that they were about 12 so I knew straight away that something had changed on the circuitry back here so um, when I traced that back I found that what was happening is this, this voltage regulator here was being dragged down by a short circuit so instead of regulating at 5 volts relative to the 17 volt rail negative 17 volt rail so it's negative 17.4 volts that it's sitting at on the input and the output was um, negative 12.6 12 12.4 whatever it was around that region All right. so it's a 5 volt difference which is what powers this chip and um, what I found was that it was sitting at 15 volts so like 2 volts difference so obviously 2 volts is enough to run the chips and this was getting hot so I knew straight away something was overloading it I chipped around like ceramic caps, stuff like that, all seemed right, but I was getting 12 ohms across what we're we getting, all on the same supply rail, so it makes sense. Is it uh, C10, C12, C13? I think there's another one too. C8. Yeah. C8, 10, 12, 13. They're all on the same supply rail, which this runs from. And that's getting a 12 ohm resistance, which is obviously what's causing the problem. Once I took this chip off, the problem was gone and this chip measures 12 ohms across its uh, VCC and ground rails so um, yeah the chip is definitely fried as soon as I took that off that stopped getting hot everything else was okay yeah I'm just waiting on the chips to arrive which I've ordered from RS components I think it was and the PLCC sockets and the programmer and once I get those I can carry on with this repair and hopefully get back to this Something else I've done as well, I didn't record it, but um, I should have done. Is I pulled this encoder apart. You can see you've got these little metal tabs that hold it together. I've lifted those out sideways, stripped it down, given it a bit of a clean up inside, put a little bit of deoxy on it, that sort of stuff, and um, bent the little fingers in there, just bent them up a bit to make them a bit better contact, a bit more tension on them. One of the ones is actually for the click, so this one here now actually clicks properly you can't see it but actually it latches in before it's just spinning free spinning now it actually clicks which is what I kind of expected from an encoder All right, it's got to indents there now so that's working again so hopefully the things I've done to the inside of that will mean this now works I don't have to try and replace it with something <laughs> whatever I don't know what I have to replace it with I have to figure that out if, if I can't if what I've done doesn't fix it but yeah, all I was trying to do was probe the pins on that to try and determine whether this pulse is going wrong or it's something else. And I made a mistake. Yeah, it happens. At least I can hopefully fix it. So, as I thought I'd just mention, when I pulled it apart, this is like the front cover goes over the display. To get this out, you have to like release these little clips here from the inside, you sort of pop them out. I found this one here was already broken. So, someone's already had this thing apart at some point. Because it was sliding around on the display as well. A little bit as well so someone's had this apart maybe to try and fix this encoder problem or maybe you I know mean, i pulled it apart and had a look i don't know but yeah so it's not completely virgin i thought i'd mention that another thing i noticed too if you look at the display see all the pins are all bent sideways like it's had some kind of impact maybe it's like been pushed sideways by something i don't know maybe it's maybe it's meant to be that way i don't know but i find that a bit weird too just doesn't look quite right does it I'm not going to try and bend them back. <laughs> Definitely not. They're staying exactly where they are. Don't want to break them off because I will be screwed. Okay, so I'm going to carry on with this repair. I've already put the PLCC socket on the board here. That was a bit of fun trying to get that on there. I haven't done one of those before. Service mount sockets like that. Got a new thing. There you go. That's what it looks like. Not the best, but it's on. The connections are good. There's no bridges. All the connections are soldered on. I used hot air, heated up the board, and I already put solder on the pads and I heated the board up with plenty of flux. And uh, thankfully it didn't melt. You can see it's a little bit there, got a little bit hot in that corner there, but 
it looks alright. The nice thing to get around the soldering on touch up colour pads which didn't quite go. I think one pin that side, one pin this side, you'll see a bit of a solder on mark on there because it's such a small thing. So anyway, so that's the socket on there. So now I'm onto the programming side. Right, so here you can see we've got the new programmer which arrived yesterday. Got it hooked up. I've got the PLCC44 socket on here and I've got one of the Atmel um, devices in there which is an AT, was it AT89S51. All right, then this is supported in the software, thankfully. I've got the firmware already installed, well, already open on the computer here. There's the firmware for the device. Here you can see I've got the program I connected up. Originally, I had trouble getting the driver to go. The driver took a while to load up, actually. It's a bit strange. Firmware is loaded. Device, let's do a blank check, I suppose. Device, uh, blank check, yep, let's do that. I haven't used this firmware much, the uh, this software, I'm just like, open up and I've play around. This is very similar to a lot of other programming software, so it says it's, it's blank, so that's fine. So let's try writing it. Device, program. Do the whole thing. And programmed. Done. That was pretty quick. Certainly look faster than EEPROMs. Alright, let's just uh, do a verify. Uh, there we go, there it is. Just to be absolutely sure it's programmed, and it is. So, all done. So, that's how easy it is to program the device. Didn't take much at all. The firmware and everything I'll make available on my website, probably on my projects page or something like that, I might do it on there. It'll also be on my Patreon area as well. I'll make it available to Patreons as part of the project of this repair. When I upload the video to Patreon, as a pre-release, then um, I'll make sure I do all the files and attachments to that, like the manuals and service manual for the power supply, information about the chip, that kind of stuff, and all the firmware, I'll upload all that. The more places that have this stuff available, the better, because if one, the place I got it from disappears, then it's gone. So if I keep a repository as well, it all helps that. So that's that chip programmed. Excellent, so now I can get on with the repair. So I can actually just push it into this socket and plug it in and see if it goes, couldn't I? Maybe I will do that. I thought I'd just show you this PLCC extractor thing, right? So these aren't necessarily obvious to everyone how you use these. You stick it in those two corners on that socket there, pin through, and you just squeeze it. And it should actually just pop the chip out and see it moving. Well, it may not be perfectly equal. You might have to just pop, hold one side down and lift it again. There we go. So that's kind of out now. Here we go. There's the chip out. Hopefully, Undamaged. So that's got to go into here. Now you see it's got one corner which is cut off. That designates like the pin one area. Well, pin one is cheap as it isn't actually a pin one. But, uh, anyway, so right, let's pop that in. Fingers crossed, it will work. I'll find out soon. Okay, so here's the board. Now, also I don't have a display in it, so I can't see what's going on, but if it beeps properly, then at least I know it's going to be working. Well, I really hope so. Let's just plug power in. Right, fingers crossed. Power it up. Single beep. Yes! Works. Encoder works. Excellent. That'll be fixed then. Brilliant. That's good news. Now I can put the display back together. Okay, so here's the display, and you can see that these legs have been already, they're already bent anyway before I even pull the thing apart, but I've caught a couple here, one's bent here, I just need to bend that back really carefully when I put it back in. It's really fragile, right, this bit here is really fragile, right, if you break that, the display's no good. Seriously, <laughs> super careful what you're doing with this. So I'm just straighten that leg out first, just really gently, just get it, I mean, just enough to get the thing to light through the hole, alright. Like that. You've got these other legs here also like bent and misaligned as well. So they're very fragile. So be really careful. Do not break one off. Because they will break off. That'll probably be the next thing that happens to me. Alright, so someone get this aligned and get it in. This is my most nervous part about this whole process is getting the thing back together.
because it isn't easy. Right. I have to line each pin at one at a time, potentially, but I can't actually see what the pins are doing. Maybe I'll see from this side instead. Underneath the uh, frame, that looks more likely to work actually. So let's see, that one's in, that one's in, that's in, 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 will be in. It's gearing the Pokemon into place, it should just drop in eventually. Once I've got it right, of course. Are in. Just a bit more. I'm just really nervous about breaking something on this because it's entirely likely it could happen. Very fragile, very easy to break. Hey, lights in. <laughs> now I need to put this on top of something, so it presses it down. I have to resold all these legs. Fine. I will put a little bit of flux on this to help it. I got to use the other flux, the thinner stuff actually. The flux pen. That just to improve my chances of having as much to clean off. Right, here we go. I'm going to go for the middle ones first to help hold it stable. I'm trying also to not put too much heat onto the pins for too long. So I tend to use a lot of heat for a short time. Because you don't want to accidentally um, put too much heat through to the display itself. So I'm soldering at 390 degrees. See? But what it does is it means I can just go on really quickly and back off again. Don't have to hold it there for very long. Because if you hold it there for long, you can actually cook things. So I find generally, in my experience at least, what's worked for me is using a high temperature for a short time. It might be a little bit too hot for what I'm doing actually, but let's um, we'll see if we go. there's not a lot of actual mess here. I hope you can see how quickly I'm doing this. So just enough to get the flow and then off. So I'll plug it back in again in a second and actually test it and see if it turns on. Oh, I hope so. Plug that back in. Plug the power back in. Alright. Turn the lights off so you can see a bit better. Hey, we have a display. She's working. Excellent. Excellent. So... It's fixed. 
at least the issue that I caused by slipping when my probe is fixed. Um, pull the probe back out before I disconnect, just in case. So now I can put the display assembly back together again. I didn't show, I think I showed them putting it apart, did I? I think I did. Here's the display assembly, and here's all the bits in this jar. Oop, turn some lights back on again. So basically what I'll do is here slotted here, it kind of slots into place. It's got these keyed bits around the sides where it kind of slots into. So I should be able to just load it down in there. Line the pot up and it should go into place. Try not to jolt it around too much because it is fragile. I should then, what happens when you push it down, it's got this little finger here which bends. That's what sort of locks it in place. So you've got to try and put it underneath all these bits and lock it in place. Try. And then I'm sticking out slightly so I can't just rest it on the front. And so I'll do this first. Right. Here we go. I think that's fully in. So I've got to put the pot back together. Somewhere I've probably got a spanner to fit this. <laughs> probably. It's a bit stiff though. I think it's someone's been at this before and I think they've cross threaded it and stuff like that, so it's not the best. Let's see if we can find a spanner. The only thing I've got that will fit this is this adjustable. Well, yeah, it's the thing that gets into it easiest. I need to get like a deep socket which will fit these. In fact I've got one somewhere. I just don't know where it is. It's not in here anyway. I used to know where it was, but that was before the flood. And things still haven't materialised. Yeah, it's kind of getting deeper than that. Let me find something else. Okay, long nose pliers. It's almost tight anyway. It's almost there. Yeah, there we go, that's it. So I actually pulled this encoder apart and gave it a clean. I don't think I mentioned that, did I? So um, the encoder was the original issue, which is what I was trying to solve on it. And um, that's when I was probing on the back of here and I slipped and bloody shorted it out and it wasn't good. So uh, mm, the, um, I sort of blew the chip up. So I actually ended up pulling that coder apart with some little tabs on it. You can pull those open and you can take the body apart. I've given it a clean, stretched all the, stretched all of the um, fingers inside, just lift them up a bit, that sort of stuff to make them return to kind of where they probably were originally and this thing actually now has detents in it as well so it actually like, stops some positions like it's supposed to um, before it didn't have anything, it was just dead smooth so it's definitely needed a bit of work on it but. so I'm going to give this a, a display a clean we'll give this a clean and um, put, pop that back in, you can see this is actually been broken previously it was already broken before I took it apart so the pit's not even here so I kind of glued a bit back on unfortunately so someone's had this apart, so but it's only minor, it should be fine. Alright, so the display back together. I gave it a clean bit of alcohol, just a little bit, and a little chamois cloth which I use as well for things like this. I did the alcohol first on some normal cloths, you know, like normal cleaning cloths, and then I used the chamois afterwards just to get any last residue off. So uh, that's really go back onto the power supply. I'll do that now. The disc is currently a little bit messy, as you can see, because I've got the program and stuff arrived all yesterday, so I've not got a container to put all the bits into yet. I'll be getting one. I just haven't got it yet. So this basically just slips over the front, and the connector goes in there. So we'll plug the connector in. And then slip that over the front. Like that. And then put your side screws in. And then that should be basically back together. I've got to obviously put the knob back on the front as well. That's still sitting there. So you can 
So you get us two screws each side. Stand up, you can see I'm doing it. Goes down that one. Another one goes in there. I can't see what I'm doing here. Make sure it's fully back. Oh, it's not a screw, it's a screw. Right. Do the other side. Hopefully that's the power supply repaired and all working. I can put it back thing back together. I hope that's the case. There we go. Pop the knob back on. These are clean first, can I? I'll do that before I put it back on actually. Put that on. Good, that's on. That now clicks like it's supposed to. Uh, should I put it back together? Let's power up again one more time, just to be sure. Then I'll put it back together. Ready? Okay. Have the display. It's all there. One, I've got two. Turn them on. Yep. All seems to be working okay. Do it, put uh, turn it up on. Yeah, before that wasn't reliable, it only it randomly miss. So yeah, that's that's not missing a beat, that's perfect. So cool, I fixed the encoder. That was the original problem. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a roundabout way of fixing it, wasn't it? Next time, just pull the thing apart, pull the encoder apart. Don't do any probing. If you get one of these and you've got an encoder playing up, just dismantle it, release those four tabs that hold the encoder together, pull the encoder apart, give it a clean inside, re lubricate it, use some of the oxygen or something like that. Bend the springs up a little bit inside, make it so it's a bit tighter, everything touches a bit better, and then put it back together. Don't do anything else. I had all this rigmarole about reprogramming the ICs and stuff because of, you know, slipping with a probe. Just, uh... But hey, it's still a good experience and hopefully it make a good video for you too. Right, so let's put it back together. Hmm. See, I'm sitting right down, it's like flush with the case. Bloody adhesive as well. There we go, now it's gone down. Interesting. Well, oh, kind of. It's half down. It doesn't sit right for some reason. No, oh, it's on. Nice, right, put the rear panel on. We can put the buffers back on. Do this by hand. Because I don't know risk splitting the plastic by overdoing it with the electric screwdriver. So I've got the bumpers to put on now. Uh, that's the back one because it's got the cutouts in it for the screws. And that's the front one. And it's got the feet on it as well, so you make sure you put them right out. And the front one. And then we're done. The repair is done. Yay! It's also got this little bit here where the something's happened to this in the past. 
the black piece is sticking out more and this little the little black ring is missing. It doesn't really matter, but it's just um, interesting that it's like that. So there we go. Unrepaired power supply. I have to do calibration and stuff like that as well yet. Yeah. And test it out, make sure it can handle load properly. That's one thing I haven't done yet. Obviously because I've been too busy repairing it. Oof. So uh, make sure you subscribe, click the bell icon, get the thing for notifications and give us a thumbs up as well. It all helps the channel. I need those thumbs up to help uh, push the channel up a bit more. It needs a bit more exposure and just helps to just helps it rank better. So it always helps any kinds of thumbs up or support you can give. Sharing your video also helps. Thanks to my Patreon supporters as well, which help me to buy things like this. Their money helps to uh, contribute to me buying better gear like this. So um, without their support, it'd be hard for me to buy things. So I really appreciate them giving me that to support. Did I say the word support enough? Maybe. Thanks for watching. Catch you next time. Bye. Well, I've got two screws left. Of course. Duh. Better put these in. You guys are probably sitting there screaming, okay? Oh, you missed those two screws. There we go. Now we don't have any bits left over. Thanks for watching. Catch you next time. Bye. Everybody uses the bloody thing. Oh, I don't remember. Um, it does have a self test routine, which I need to remember what to do there. Um, I think you have to push something when you, when you turn it on. I think you have to push calibrate when you turn it on, was it? Cow mode. And it's like any good PC, it's doing updates before it shuts down.